So there's a lot of very interesting information relating to vitamin D and cortisol, that relationship. So let's talk about it. Under stress, especially chronic stress, what happens is the vitamin D gets less absorbed in your gut. So anytime you have high stress, your vitamin D level goes down, okay? That's one thing that happens, but there's something else as well. The building block of vitamin D is the same building block as the stress hormone cortisol. And that building block is cholesterol. They're both made out of cholesterol. In fact, even vitamin D as itself is really considered for many reasons, more of a hormone than a vitamin especially the steroid hormones in the family of cortisol. The chemistry of cortisol, which is the stress hormone, is very similar to vitamin D as well, but they're both made from cholesterol. So as you go through stress, the cholesterol is allocated as a precursor to build more of that stress hormone and away from other things like vitamin D. This is another reason why people end up with low vitamin D when they have high levels of stress. And very unfortunately, the cortisol tends to paralyze the immune system. It lowers the white blood cell. It makes you more susceptible to getting infections, and especially viral infections. Not to mention compounded on top of that, a low vitamin D level that's so important with your immune system and immune protection and even controlling an overactive immune system. And then another interesting thing about this is when you go through a lot of stress, a lot of times that can be the trigger of an autoimmune disease, whether it's MS, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, Graves' disease, type 1 diabetes. All of these conditions can be triggered by some type of stress. So then once you get the autoimmune disease, what is the treatment? The treatment is prednisone. What is prednisone? It's a synthetic form of cortisol. So that's interesting that this stress might have triggered it, but then now you need prednisone as a treatment to get rid of inflammation. So apparently cortisol is an anti-inflammatory. And if you have too much of it in your body, then why would someone even have uh, inflammation in the first place? And it probably my guess is that when you have a lot of a certain hormone in the bloodstream, that can create a bit of a resistance. Just like insulin resistance, you could have a cortisol resistance. That's just my guess, but it could also have something to do with vitamin D. Since vitamin D is a very potent and powerful anti-inflammatory. In fact, vitamin D is what I always recommend for autoimmune conditions. There's a lot of research on that, um, but the problem is you can't just use the, the smaller amounts. The RDAs uh, for vitamin D is what, like 600 I use. That was all based on research for your bone to prevent bone loss, but not necessarily to have this therapeutic effect on autoimmune inflammatory conditions. For those conditions, you need a lot more. You might need 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 I use of vitamin D to create the effects, especially with other barriers from absorbing vitamin D. Uh, you have genetic barriers. It's called a polymorphism, where you have this gene that doesn't allow you to uh, convert vitamin D into the active form. It doesn't allow you to absorb vitamin D in the vitamin D receptor. When I did some DNA testing with, um, I think, 20, over 20 people, okay, it wasn't a lot, but it was 20 people, 100% of those people all had at least one gene that was inhibiting either the conversion to the active form of vitamin D or just the activation of the vitamin D receptor. So in other words, from that, it just led me to the idea that a lot of people are just not absorbing enough vitamin D. Another reason is, is if you're older, you don't absorb uh, as much vitamin D. If your skin is, is darker, you're not gonna absorb as much vitamin D from the sun anyway. And not to mention people aren't out in the sun very much. And you have the winter time. Then you have also insulin resistance can block the absorption of vitamin D. And so there's a lot of barriers. The cards are stacked against you with vitamin D. So an average person has high cortisol and low vitamin D, but they both have similar properties in what they can do, especially when we get into the area of inflammation and autoimmune conditions and other conditions too, like even uh, type two diabetes, which is not an autoimmune. And even with adrenal concerns, okay, adrenal problems, whether someone has too much adrenal hormone or not enough. Vitamin D is gonna be important. There's an interesting paper I read that 
if you give someone vitamin D that has high levels of cortisol, it can help bring it down, which is interesting. So I think uh, the more stress someone has, the more vitamin D they need to counter maybe this reallocation of the cholesterol problem because they don't have enough precursors, especially if they're on a low fat diet. And also, especially if someone goes through menopause, because what happens in menopause is you have this um, loss of ovarian function. And now we have this backup organ from the adrenals, which now has to make up for these lost hormones. And if there's a bit of stress in this process where the adrenals are weak, then cortisol is going to be stressed. And so is vitamin D. And I think the solution is not just adding vitamin D, but also adding cholesterol, making sure that you have enough fat, maybe consume more grass-fed butter uh, or meats, things like that. Another little side note about uh, vitamin D is when you get it tested, um, they always test the inactive form because that's more stable. It's more difficult and not as reliable to check the active form. So they check the inactive form, which doesn't really tell you what's happening inside the cells as well. You have to be able to take all the information and and look at it. Let's say, for, for example, someone has a problem with the receptor absorbing vitamin D, whether they have a genetic problem with the receptor, or let's say they have a viral infection. Certain viruses uh, trick the vitamin D receptor to downgrading them. It's a whole survival mechanism, which is pretty sneaky and pretty evil. And the solution to that is to take more vitamin D to overcome that. But the point is that you can't always put all your eggs in that one basket, like testing someone's blood level for vitamin D, especially if they have some of these other problems. And maybe you want to do a genetic test just to see if that's one issue as well, especially if you're going through stress and especially if you have vitamin D deficiency symptoms. I want to give you several things to improve. The situation of low vitamin D and high cortisol, okay? Uh, number one, Take more vitamin D, okay? Get it from the sun, uh, eat fatty fish, uh, or just take a good vitamin uh, D3 supplement and probably minimally uh, take about 10,000 IUs. But if you have a problem, you might need to take more. Now, number two, I did a video on this. Magnesium is essential for vitamin D to work as well. Magnesium also helps lower cortisol. So make sure you also at the same time uh, either consume magnesium foods, which are in the leafy greens, spinach, it's in almonds as well, but make sure you have like maybe some cheese with that spinach or with your almonds just to get the calcium to prevent the um, oxalates that could be an issue with those two things, especially if you're on keto. People consume a lot of these foods that are high in oxalates, chocolate, spinach, almonds. You can start to do other leafy greens and salads and dark green vegetables but believe it or not, it's it's not as easy as you might think to get magnesium. But the point is that more magnesium will help uh, vitamin D work and it will also help cortisol be lowered. Magnesium glycinate is the one that I like. All right, number three, zinc. I also did a video on that in relationship to vitamin D. The vitamin D receptor needs zinc as an essential thing to allow that vitamin D receptor to work and absorb vitamin D. So we need zinc and we need magnesium. Without those two, you're not gonna be able to absorb as much vitamin D. Another uh, key factor is to maybe take some adaptogens. I like ashwagandha, but there's other ones as well. But adaptogens help to bring cortisol to a normal level. They're interesting because whether you have too much cortisol or not enough cortisol, they help balance that. They increase your tolerance for stress. They also will help with uh, adrenaline too, to help balance adrenaline. Of course, exercise would be at the top of the list. Long walks, hikes, things like that. Very important to reduce stress and cortisol, especially. Just make sure you don't overtrain. And then of course, the next one is going to be sleep, right? Sleep helps lower cortisol, and that will help you retain more vitamin D as well, right? You'll never be able to bring your cortisol levels down without also fixing your sleep. But of course, magnesium will help that. Zinc will help that. Exercise, long walks will help that. And vitamin D will help that as well especially if you have a circadian rhythm uh, problem, whether it's from jet lag or your sleep cycles are off or whatever. Another one that you might not know about is sea salt. When you are sodium deficient, cortisol tends to go a little higher. So sometimes, especially when you're on a ketogenic diet, you may need a little bit more sea salt in the diet and that can help you sleep 
faster and better and give you more quality of sleep, but it can also reduce stress as well. And so there's other ways of ending up with not enough sodium as well. Drinking a lot of water um, that you're diluting the salt and just not putting on the food. Getting more sun. That spectrum infrared can come in. It penetrates the body. It's a great antioxidant. And isn't melatonin good for sleep as well? It can be, right? Next one is vitamin B1. That can help reduce stress and cortisol anxiety and nervous tension uh, from a different angle. Uh, I always like B1 as the stress reducer. Um, it works like within three minutes. Nutritional yeast has a good amount of B1, but make sure you have a B1 that is from a natural source. And just as a side note, what creates a deficiency of B1 is consuming a lot of refined sugar and refined carbohydrate. The more you do for that, the more B1 is needed. The same thing with stress. The more stress you have, the more vitamin D you need. And the more cortisol or stress you have, also the more cholesterol you might need to build not just your adrenal hormones, but the vitamin D as well. Now, there's one last remedy I want to talk to you about that I can't really talk too much about it on YouTube uh, because it handles a really interesting problem. I will put that on my website. But the remedy is called AHCC. And this remedy does a lot of things, but one of the things that it does, it has a very unique effect on calming down the sympathetic nervous system and also improving your parasympathetic. And that's why it's really good for sleep. You take this right before bed and that can help you greatly. And if you are on my email list, uh, you will get a video on this of all the other things it does. But that being said, I do have a, an, a very long list of all of the actions that you can do and all the things you can take to lower cortisol, which goes way beyond what I just gave you right here. If you want a free copy of that, it's a one-page summary. I put a link down below where you can download it right now.